Welcome to Brain Junk. I'm Amy Barton. And I'm Trace Kerr. Sarcasm and slang is a double-edged sword. Slang defines group and also excludes, and sarcasm can be a snarky way to deflect anger. Either way, today we'll be talking about everything you never knew you wanted to know about sarcasm and slang. Yeah, it's going to be great. Super. It's going to be terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to dig in first. What is slang? And we all use it regularly. And so you're familiar with examples of it. But I found a page on the University of South Carolina's website called Cocky Talk. And their mascot <laughs> is... What did you say? You looked him up, Tracy. Oh, it was a game cock. Yes. So it's it's legit. And they have a whole page about slang, which is really fun. What is slang then? It's a deliberate alternative vocabulary that sends social signals. And I think that's inter- that's a part I hadn't thought about very much, that it's a social definer and it's an inside joke of sorts, or it depends on the consciousness of shared knowledge between the speaker and the hearer. So you might have in your workplace some shared vocabulary or among school peers. It, it could be regional. It could be... Co- the, the word colloquialism springs to mind a lot for this, right? where it's a specific to a place or to a group of people. Is there teacher slang? Oh, yes, I'm sure there are. <laughs> uh, there's office lady f- slang. Frequent flyers are kids that we see in the health room a lot. Oh, there you go. Uh, that's, okay. That's a good example. And so you could even have a parent of a frequent flyer in the office and yep. mention frequent flyers and she would have... No idea what you were talking about. Folks do catch on to that one. Oh, they do. <laughs> that, that is not a very, that's a thinly veiled slang term. <laughs> yeah. There's some taboo around it, and that can have varying levels. As you get into more formal situations, there's less use of slang. A word can gradually become degraded, and so there's this idea. Like if you LOL me in a text uh, and you're a family member, I will probably say... Did you really LOL? Can you not spell? Did you not go to college? I, I'll call them out on it in <laughs> a really offensive way. So much influence you have had. I hardly <laughs> use it at all anymore because I'm like, Amy doesn't like this. So I, so now I'm like, ha, huh, exclamation point. And I still feel kind of silly because I'm like, LOL is kind of saying the same thing. That but... was so droll. <laughs> I found it charming. <laughs> Uh, but I'm terrible to my sisters if they do it. And so now Ruth will send me emojis, but she will not. And emojis is a further degradation of language or a more descriptive. I think we'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. But And our culture doesn't have French. You've got the formal levels, tu or vu, you or you, the formal. We don't have that in our language, but we definitely have some cultural ideas of in a workplace, you're less likely to use slang at your boss in a meeting, although you might with your colleagues in your workspace. That degradation of the language or that it's for a particular group, it's less formal most of the time with slang. So you're kind of creating that That bond, you know, that we're all talking the same language Mm -hmm. together. Yes. Hmm. The how does a word become slang is kind of fun. You'll hear partial words. Totally is totes. I love to say things like (laughs) totes. Uh, Ammunition is ammo. Administration becomes admin. I enjoy those obnoxious words that my kids hate, though. Um, Yeah. When we went to WSU, we called. Oh, never mind. I can't say any of that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See, and that's exactly, that's a perfect example of it's less formal. It's often the cocky talk got more into profanity too, which we're not going to do here. But profanity is for sure a great example of slang. We It's on that edge of mm-hmm. offensive maybe sometimes. Or, mm-hmm. or, well, and what I was going to say isn't a offensive an offensive word. It's definitely not a positive kind of thing. Yeah. And so... <laughs> You know, among peers, that's okay. Yeah, there can be some joshing and some friendly ribbing, which we'll get into sarcasm later. Oh, yes. There's definitely some shared space here with these two things. I enjoy the mashing words together. That's another form of slang, like ginormous, for instance. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And frenemy or bromance. Bromance might be my favorite. I like brony, you know, because that just makes... Brony? You don't know (gasps) brony? I don't. That is a man who likes my little pony. Oh! (laughs) What? And it's a whole thing. Go on Instagram, put in brony. Well, maybe don't. If you're an adult, maybe go look at that first, and then you can have your kids take a look at it. But yeah, a brony is a a guy who likes uh, my little pony. And that's the perfect example of in a time and place in culture... 
in American culture right now, that well, word makes sense. And it's probably not now. I mean, I'm old. Five years so ago. So that's probably, yeah. Well, 20 years that's ago? That's probably close. No, that's probably closer <laughs> to like around birth of last kid. Well, yeah, it'd be like 10. Yeah. Okay, I'm stop okay. talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, abbreviations are the one other form of slang that has hugely exploded in the advent of our use of keyboards in regular immediate communication. The abbreviations like LOL, which we just spoke of, where it's faster, AFK, BRB. Then the problem with those acronyms is I'm constantly looking them up. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the like, uh, to be honest, TBH Mm -hmm. does not stick in my head. Every single time I see it, I have to look it up again. I was floating on Instagram and happened to see something on my 14-year-old daughter's profile from a friend. And it was accompanied by a bunch of relatively benign emojis. But I didn't know what the letters stood for. And I had this parent heart attack moment. And so I'm frantically Googling, what does this mean, this string of letters? It was nice. It was fine. But as a, that's definitely... Uh, a gap culturally for me. I'm not in that Mm. text language culture. So again, that defines a group and there's camaraderie in that and there's some exclusivity in in it to a certain degree. And when you use it wrong. Oh, uh, you know, um, WTF is a great example. Well, yeah. And then I'm, you know, I'm write young adult books Mm -hmm. and my daughter was reading the latest draft and I have two characters texting in between each other and they're like 15 and she came back and she was like, Mom, they wouldn't do this. Mom, <laughs> nobody. And then what's with the punctuation? Okay, so the punctuation has to go. So there are all these Oh, cues. stream of consciousness? No. Well, no, there are all these cues. And I had used, a, I used yeah. WTF and she was like, nobody uses that anymore. And so. Oh, now I want to know what they say instead. No, well, I don't. Not on the show. Sorry, no, no. folks. You can Google it like I will later. <laughs> it's creating a group within you, but then it's also definitely putting everybody else off at an arm's length if you don't get it. Yes. And by the time it becomes a part of popular culture, at least for this particular group, I we are behind the trend now <laughs> because I'm not of that that group anymore. So it is an interesting phenomenon culturally too. Cockney slang is a fun example of that. I'm going to jump right to that. It's not where my notes go, but I'm going to tell you Cockney slang is a great example of it defines a group and it excludes a group. Oh, so Cockney is the last word rhymes with whatever it is that you're talking about. Yes? That's how the phrases originate. Okay. Yes, because it was originally there's not a ton of documentation about its origin initially because it sprang up pretty organically among the group of people in England where you have to live to be considered a Cockney. And it's within hearing of the Bow Bells, which are the Church of St. Mary Le Beau, Cheapside in the city of London. And there was a study done in 2000, actually, where they said, well, where would you have to, how far could you live from the bells and still hear them? And it's about six to three miles. They did a whole study. They would just start in a compass direction and wait for the bell and see how far out they were. So (laughs) in certain places, things were right that you could hear them six miles out. In other places, only three. The Oxford English Dictionary website tells you they've got the whole, wow, the parameters and all the bergs. Are they called Bergs in England? All the little neighborhood kind Mm -hmm. of things. It's neighborhoods where different classes would mingle. And this was definitely a lower class. The thieves and commoners were using this kind of language. And it was specifically to exclude the high class people they were working near. And it totally reminds me of My Fair Lady, where you have all those working people that are doing their jobs around the fancy posh folks. And that allowed them to have this conversation where they could speak freely among each other, Uh, but not be understood. It's like when you speak more than one language and you assume that somebody else doesn't and you can switch into your other language and you're Mm -hmm. just fine talking about them. Yes. Hmm. Bad news. Mm -hmm. One thing I found very interesting about the Cockney that I didn't realize, because you see it, it, I see it in movies and TV, in most things that I've seen, they'll use the full rhyming phrase. And so it's a direct rhyme to whatever trouble and strife is wife. Um, but in a in a real Cockney conversation, they'll probably in that phrase drop the rhyming word. And so trouble might be wife, but you are not going to be able to infer based on context as much because they don't have the full rhyme in. Much easier when you do the full rhyme. They often drop that rhyming word. Right. Because in Ocean's Eleven, you know, it's a crime movie Mm -hmm. and there's a thief and everything has gone bad. And he's sitting there talking to the whole group Mm -hmm. and he says, it's all gone Barney. Mm -hmm. And he's 
English, and they're all looking at him like he's completely crazy because they're all Americans and they have no idea what he's saying. Yeah. And then he says, it's Barney Rubble, Trouble. <laughs> he used that that shortening, like you yes. just said, that abbreviation. Without thinking about it. Yes. So mm-hmm. you wouldn't know what, what's Barney. I don't so even good know. Knows, good news. You're like his bro because he's just using his slang with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> there is a terrific dictionary online. It's oh. cockneyrhymingslang.co.uk. Look it up. I'll put it on the website. Mm. And it has a little rhyming slang thing where you can put a phrase in and it'll spit it back out in Cockney. But it didn't do very well. However, what it does do well is it's got a direct dictionary slang to English and English to slang. Ooh. So you can look up whole phrases. Like I looked up, my bottle of porter got Erin Grace's on her Penelope Keith. She's really in Michael Caine. It's going to cost a lot of bees and honey. I went to the pedal and crank and got my last few Oxford scholars. So let's go have a tumble down the sink. So what? The, okay, so back yeah. up, back up and give me the, give my me My bottle the... of porter got Erin and graces on our Penelope Keith. Airs and graces. Mm-hmm. I'm giving you direct rhymes. Whoa. I think Michael Caine is pain. Yep. Okay. But I don't know what the first sentence is. <laughs> braces. Ah. So my bottle of porter got braces on her Penelope Keith. She's really in pain. That's how much you've translated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to continue? <laughs> sure. Why now, not? <laughs> now you've got context too. So you well, can figure out. The my first bottle of porter. Got braces. Yeah. She got braces. On her Penelope Keith. Bottle of Porter. Uh, this would probably be better if I could say it with a Cockney accent because bottle of Porter is for daughter. Daughter. Ah, so but your I don't daughter got braces daughter, and yeah. she's in a lot of pain. Okay, On got her it. teeth is her Penelope Keith. Teeth. Gosh. Um, bees and honey is money. I also enjoy, let's see, the pedal and crank is the bank. I think that's a fun one. <laughs> Oxford scholars, dollars, and a tumble down the sink is a drink. Oh, I like that. I don't think a, a real Cockney person is going to use that much slang no, in probably one not. sentence. They, they're probably right now going, ugh, Americans. Yes. <laughs> You're not as funny as you think. No, we're totally not. So it's fun, though. You could look up entire pages of stuff because they've got all kinds of words in there, but you could throw them into the family language to salt it up a little. Oh, there you go. Inside family jokes. Tell us about sarcasm. Well, okay, so slang. I'd love to hear about sarcasm. Yeah, I'm sure you would. <laughs> right. <laughs> slang and other things like that, I think, all come from the deep, dark depths mm-hmm. of sarcasm in some way. Sarcasm is understatement and irony. Mm-hmm. The Greek root for sarcasm is sarcasian, which means tear flesh like dogs. Ooh, that's a very great visual. An example from a, there's a billboard and it was an advertisement for trying to get men to go to the doctor more. Mm-hmm. And it says this year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. <laughs> and in spray paint and all caps across the bottom, it's it said, no, we won't. <laughs> so it's that. Oh, that makes me happy. It's the humor and yet maybe not humor. Mm-hmm. So let's explore it a little bit. Sarcasm is people saying the opposite of what they mean. And it's mm-hmm. usually done because they think the original statement made was foolish or that it should be obvious that they were kidding. And it's often said with a slight change of voice, sounding more serious or more naive, mocking mm-hmm. even and mocking your own words, which is I use sarcasm a lot. And usually it's pointed at mm-hmm. myself. I'll be working in the kitchen, you drop a knife and you're like, well, that was great. Mm-hmm. Good job, Grace. Uh, oh, and this was a great one. So this is from a math test. So the text of the question said, Bob has 36 candy bars. He eats 29. What does he have now? And the answer the student wrote is diabetes. Bob (laughs) has diabetes. (laughs) Yes. I enjoy some of those. I do too. I put on the website, BuzzFeed has their top 20 sarcastic kind of things. That's where I got the math test one from. Awesome. They're very fun to look at. Evolutionary biologists believe that it's our ability to recognize and keep track of hundreds of relationships and how we live by social calculation that makes humans so successful. So the question is, where does sarcasm come in? Mm -hmm. Well, humor is super important. If someone doesn't get your jokes, they aren't as attractive to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've talked about... Listening to you do the intercom stuff at oh, yeah. the elementary school, that was super funny. And that was like, oh, this person is interesting. I need to get to know them. Well, we also look for people who get our snide remarks. Yes. You know, somebody who gets that kind of 
I'm not thrilled with this situation. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make a joke out of it. Yes. It gives you that little subculture. That's not the right word. Well, but it kind of, I mean, but like slang, Mm -hmm. you've got that same sort of relationship here where if we're in an office setting and we're talking about something and maybe I'm not liking the fact that the new water cooler only has cold water and not hot water. And Mm -hmm. so I could be filling my cup and everybody's listening and I'm like, boy, it sure would be nice if I could make some soup out of this. But no, cold water seems fine, you know, and then (laughs) somebody else who maybe feels the same way is going to be, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, hey, let me get a cup of noodle, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's that. Al dente. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm, crunchy. <laughs> oh, it's so good this way. So let's go a little deeper. According to neurophysiologist Catherine Rankin at the University of California, she was talking about the, the idea that sarcasm is an emotional tool to poke around the boundaries of conversations, like my mm-hmm. example in the office talking about the water cooler. It's a safe way to show dissent without getting in trouble for it. Mm -hmm. So if I was to say that snarky thing about the water cooler and everybody was looking at me blankly. (laughs) Yes. Or kind of, ah, that's The person that greenlit the purchase of the new one is in the room. (laughs) And then it kind of floats away. I can figure out, oh, maybe I'm the only one who's unhappy about this. Yes. Yeah. And what's interesting is more empathetic people tend to use and pick up on sarcasm, which is counterintuitive. So the people who are most likely to be hurt by sarcasm are the most likely to notice it. Okay. Are they likely to use it or they're just, it's high on their radar? And they're more likely to use it. Okay. Here's an interesting thing about starting to use sarcasm. Children, on average begin to recognize that someone is using sarcasm sometime between the ages of six and eight. I would say my children, my my daughter is precocious. Well, I would hazard a guess that yours was too. Yes. So here's the funny thing. (laughs) It can take some kids up until high school age to get it. Yep. Uh, Yep. Children whose families use sarcasm often get it by the age of four or earlier because they hear it all the time. I I know. Like, oh, yeah, the my snarky little brat. That is my, yeah. Uh, Let's go with clever. We have clever daughters. Well, yes, because, well, here's a funny thing. So sarcasm, you have to use more brain power to translate it. Mm-hmm. That's true. And it's, so sarcasm is picked up on the right side of your brain instead of the left side. Left is where language is, where right you would is expect the it to be. Side? Well, that and context and okay. social stuff. How much of it is visual? Did it talk about that there? Because if it's, I don't see somebody speaking sarcastically, I look up at them to see what their body is telling me. I'm not sure. Yeah, because you're trying to catch that cue. But yeah. this is even if you're not seeing them, if you're just hearing that, you're processing it on this other side in mm-hmm. the parahippocampal gyrus. Mm-hmm. So that's the part of the brain that helps with social context. The awareness of sarcasm is so important to how our brains work. They've started using a test to determine if they have dementia. Really? Yeah, it's the awareness of social inference test. They've found that if you lose the ability to detect and translate sarcasm, it's a very early indicator of a certain kind of dementia. I guess that makes sense. I'm curious how much new language learners also, how much that indicates fluency, your understanding of. I would think that would indicate a huge amount of fluency because the jump that you have to make from... Just understanding the words alone to... to how we use it. And slang works the same way. You know, you definitely can tell when somebody is beginning to grasp the whole ball of wax for language when they can get that slang and they can get the sarcasm because Mm -hmm. we're using it in a completely different way. Yeah. Well, it's like us if we with your Cockney rhyming stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of have an idea, but every single one of those phrases you said. Slow down. Slow down. Wait, wait, wait. uh, uh. So then I would just be left doing that thing people always do when you don't understand the language, (laughs) but you don't want them to know. And you just kind of nod. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I totally got that. Mm -mm. (laughs) (laughs) They've also found that in children, the lack of ability to detect sarcasm can be an indication of autism or schizophrenia, or more likely, they're just not in a sarcastic family. 
Mm -hmm. And I definitely found working with elementary school students that there are children who, I mean, I knew I learned very quickly I had to dial myself back (laughs) because, you know, I'd have a little kid come to me. And in my house, if you come to me and you've cut yourself and you're being overly dramatic about it, I will Mm -hmm. say, oh, no, do we need to amputate? (laughs) Yes. And, and, you know, and they know that means, okay, I need to chill. Well, Mm -hmm. I used that once on a child whose family does not use sarcasm. You burst into tears. Nervous breakdown yeah. because <laughs> this poor child thought I was serious. Yes. Yeah. And also, <laughs> kids don't get the, you know, often if I'm using sarcasm with a person, I try to make sure that I catch, like you said, what is their face doing? I try to catch mm-hmm. their eye. I try to throw them a smile to be like, hey, we're we're joking here. Yeah. Some Little people kids, are real dry. They don't, but they don't get the facial expression either. You know, well, I could throw a smile cue at a kid who doesn't get sarcasm mm-hmm. and they're just still looking it's at me helping. like, why are you smiling at me while you say that mean thing? <laughs> Then <laughs> you just feel like you're beating them. Yeah. I'm sorry. Then I realize I really am a monster. Um, but there are some positives. Sarcasm can help people cope as a way to express mm-hmm. both expectation as well as disappointment. A rainstorm ruins a trip to the park. Oh, mm-hmm. A great day to go to the park. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. I, that's one of my favorites. It's fine. It's, it's fine. fine. Oh, yeah. We all know that means yeah. it's not... <laughs> I probably use more sarcasm than I realize if I'm talking to a student, really talking to my coworkers around me. No, it's fine. Let me put my work down. And because kids don't get it. They're like, great, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna solve my problem. And I'm like, your problem is that you tied your shoelaces together, friends. Not- <laughs> See, and there's a danger there because sarcasm can like yeah. make a terrible left turn into yeah. passive Kinda aggressiveness. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so and that's not where it's funny. No, I had a boy in high school tell me you're a nice girl that's really cutting you don't want people to think of you that way (laughs) and I'd just like to say thanks Jake that was helpful (laughs) it was it was really good for me because there is definitely a point where you're getting really good at it as a teenager I was so good Mm. at it and then you become a really unsafe person to be around because you're, you're just so slicing cutting. people. And it's funny for everybody else. And then you become a bully. And so it was a good moment <laughs> in my life. It was painful and helpful. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So Well, that kind of disproves the whole. We're more likely to use sarcasm with friends than enemies. Mm-hmm. I uh, would agree with that. He was being a time. friend because he was. He was being direct about my overuse of sarcasm. Ouch. <laughs> I thought I was clever and hilarious. And <laughs> turns out I'd stepped over a boundary somewhere. You've gone too far. I had, yeah. College students in Israel, they did a study with them with sarcasm. They had they were listening to complaints to a cell phone company's customer service line, <laughs> which sounds awful. But researchers found that the students were better able to solve problems creatively when the caller's comments were sarcastic rather than just angry. Sarcasm appears to stimulate complex thinking and attenuates the otherwise negative effect of anger. So if mm-hmm. they got that the person was being sarcastic, wow, this cell phone works great, then <laughs> they could have a laugh together yeah. and try to come up with something instead of somebody just coming on and just rah all over them about the fact that their phone wasn't working. That makes sense in a lot of ways because it's, uh, I'm feeling frustrated. It's something to grab onto. I can help you with that. Yeah. As opposed to being directly attacked. You're just fending them off. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, man, I've been there. I've totally Mm -hmm. been there because we have all been there. Thinking about how sarcasm developed in Western culture, because that's mostly what I could find research on, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. There is a thought that Vikings, people from cloudy, dark, wintry (laughs) sort of places, brought sarcasm to the rest of lower Europe. There's this great example, Dr. Matthew Townsend, who is an expert in Old Norse from the University of York, says Anglo-Saxon texts Mm -hmm. show a fondness for terse understatement. I love that phrase. Often of a humorous kind. So, for example, in Gretter's Saga, which is a story poem, the hero's brother Atli is stabbed fatally through the stomach, and his dying words are more or less, I see that broad spears are in fashion this year. <laughs> it's that droll kind of dry... Oh, yeah. That eventually brings us Monty Python. Yes, and that was something... Grateful. Yes, and that was something that got talked about a lot, that the... 
use of sarcasm and irony as humor as humor is distinct in places like UK and parts of the United States with things like Monty Python and things mm-hmm. like that. And I have a theory that so we lived in Southern California for mm, seven years. Mm-hmm. And I'm Washington born and bred, also cloudy, also rainy, yep. you know, Seattle, that kind of thing. And we moved down to Southern California and it's sunny all the time. <laughs> and I'm working out my best sarcastic mar- remarks and people constantly whoosh right over their head. I'd love another cup of this cold coffee. Oh, like totally. I'll be right back. Oh, yeah. Or, and then a friend of mine who was also from Washington moved down to San Diego and she's working in nonprofit, which are, yeah. you know, kind of your hoot hipper, looser people yeah. in some ways. She's using sarcasm left and right because mm-hmm. she uses it primarily pointed at herself. Mm-hmm. And Self-deprecatingly. her boss had to pull her aside and ask her to stop using sarcasm because People aren't getting it, and they don't know why you're talking about yourself that way. (laughs) And so, my yeah. So, and I talked to a couple more people that I, you know, just over the past week that are Mm -hmm. from Southern California, and half of the people were like, "Oh yeah, that is kind of a thing," and the other half were, "Well, it's just not something that's done culturally." Well, I have a theory as to why they get more vitamin D. I, yes, because it seems like super sarcastic places mm-hmm. w- that use a lot of that kind of poking, angry, snarky humor that I just love deep in my soul are yeah. from places that are cloudy and mm-hmm. dark and there's long winters and it's not nice outside and you still have to go outside because, you know, mm-hmm. who cares if it's raining? Go out on the playground, you know, that kind of thing. And you've got to find humor wherever. Yeah. And I think where it's sunny all the time and nice, people, like you said, maybe it's more vitamin D or they're just happier. <laughs> I don't know. But you just don't see it as often. It's definitely a part of family culture for us, too. Um, one of my favorite family pictures is my dad was unexpectedly hospitalized and we're all at the, it's him in the bed and we're all behind him. And it's my favorite family picture. And it comes from that kind of that similar culture of it's, well, if we don't laugh at this, what are we going to laugh at? Exactly. And what's cool is I found a study. Thank you study for supporting my theory. (laughs) They did of the United States. Northerners are more likely to use sarcastic jibes and more likely to think sarcasm is funny. 56% of Northerners found it funny. (laughs) 35% Really? <laughs> 35% of Southerners wow. did. So a huge difference. Southerners are more gracious, too, culturally, I... theoretically. Well, I have a feeling that in the uh, <laughs> West-South, which would be California, it's too yeah. pretty. And in yeah. the East-South, it's just too hot. We don't have time to be funny. We got to <laughs> we gotta just sit here and cool just off. Just moving slowly. Yeah. No, none of that. And trying to mitigate their hair issues. <laughs> You know, yeah, it gets curly. Mm-hmm. One of our delightful friends, Lanny Caraway, recommended and got my wheels rolling on this topic. So thank you, Lanny. Red Herrings and White Elephants, The Origins of the Phrases We Use Every Day by Albert Jack. And my daughter flipped through here last night. I said, find me some fun stuff. And she immediately finds all the dark ones, anything with... Anatomical references? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And so I won't be sharing those, but you could get the book yourself and enjoy them. You were mentioning the Norse origin of sarcasm. Possibly. Possibly. Possible. Some yeah. possible connections. Well, they are also noted as possibly the origin for the phrase, it's raining cats and dogs. And I'm weird on my microphone because I'm trying to look at a book and read. Raining cats and dogs? Cats and dogs feature heavily in stormy weather art because cats are thought to be associated with bringing the rain and dogs the gales and so there's the theory that that's where that it's raining cats and dogs it's big big rain because the cats and then the gales are from the dogs wow so oh i liked this one i say that everything's my favorite and i love everything to knock the daylights out of somebody Mm. uh the eyes were if you were to receive a beating in days gone by it means you got punched in your eyes your daylights where you see the light so that was a fun that's an interesting one oh that is not what i would have thought no a plum job. That was um, <laughs> like, wow, that's a plum job. Yes. I read that in a more sarcastic way. And I think maybe we use it that way now. But originally, a plum referred to a thousand pounds. And so if it was a plum job, you probably were making big change. Oh. Cha-ching. 
Oh. Namby Pamby is an interesting phrase. It was one my daughter had never heard the phrase Namby Pamby. My mom is somewhat conservative and is not a heavy sarcasm user. So if she calls you a Namby Pamby, you know, she's bringing her big guns. <laughs> But my daughter has never heard that. So thank you, mom, for being so kind to my daughter. <laughs> um, but a Namby Pamby, that phrase came about in late 1600s, early 1700s. And it was used in reference to the poet Ambrose Phillips. And he was teased about being for using childish language and like that sing songy, rhymey words. Mm. And so people around him started calling him a Namby Pamby because they thought that his work was juvenile. Ow. Yeah. Now, but I kind of feel like Namby Pamby has kind of, well, you don't really hear it anymore, had kind of a connotation of... Kind of sissy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of... Some of those offensive... What we would be saying to someone if we wanted to make a guy feel like he was being too girly. Right. Like that would be a bad thing. Mm Mm-hmm. There there does seem to be some implication there. Hmm. The not manly. Well, because if you're being childish, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. To pull your finger out is one she flagged, and I appreciate that. <laughs> and actually, it it doesn't have to do with the, again, I thought it would be the, the nursery rhyme. Put your rhyme. thumb and pull out a plum. Yes. I thought it might be that reference, but it's actually in the fervor of battle when guns were loaded by hand with gunpowder. In a cannon, you'd have to pour a small amount of gunpowder into the ignition hole, and in a rush... If you didn't have the wooden plug in place, you should put a wooden plug in and then walk away or run away. In a pinch, a guy stands there and holds his finger over the hole so it's not getting out. And then whoever's lighting that cannon off tells them, yells at them to pull their finger out and run. There's no mention of how many fingers and hands have been blown off because I'm sure some. So that's so a, there's, that's a, there's a some urgency. Origin. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, so a great urgency. And pull your thumb out. <laughs> pull your finger out. Yeah, we don't use it that way anymore. There's a a different context now culturally, I think. Well, it's got um... more of a... That's another one you don't... I don't think you hear very much anymore. Mm -mm. But my dad would use it if I was lollygagging. If I was taking too long, he'd be like, pull your finger out, you know? Come on, we need to go. Let's get on with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please come visit us at brainjunkpodcast.com. We'll have... Some pictures, maybe mostly research on my half. Notes for you on sarcasm and slang for this and other wonderful episodes. Look for Brain (laughs) Junk wherever you find your podcasts. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. We tweet at My Brain Junk, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Brain Junk Podcast. Trace and I will catch you next time when we share more of everything you never knew you wanted to know. And I guarantee you will not be bored. Well, that's not. Probably. Yeah. Hopefully. I might be. I don't know. (laughs) Shh.